Today marks seven days where she has been the presumptive Democrat nominee and 17 days where she has refused to answer questions from the media. President Trump will go anywhere into hostile audiences, into friendly audiences, and answer tough questions. I will go anywhere and answer tough questions because I respect the American people enough to say that I should have to earn your vote. I shouldn't be expected to be given your vote while I hide in a basement or stand in front of a teleprompter, which is exactly what Kamala Harris has done. So I'd ask all the reporters here to show a little bit of self-awareness. All right, demand. that is Donald Trump's running mate, Ohio Senator J.D. Vance, speaking now in Michigan. He's also gone directly after Tim Walls over his military record. Back with us now, Republican strategist Susan Del Percio and Democratic strategist Basil Smeichel. Again, Vance is on this shadow tour going where the Democratic ticket is going. Trump's not with him. But what did you make of those comments, Susan, we just heard? They weren't very good. I mean, the point of a vice president, there are two things. It's to put forward the, the ticket's agenda and attack, frankly, the opponent. So him going after Harris the way he has is just kind of pitiful. It's That's what he's got. He's, she's in a basement. He should be, if he wants to talk about a record, talk about a record. He's hiding because he's He's got nothing else. And so he says he goes into hostile territory. He still can't answer a straight question. So, I mean, he, this is the guy who comes up with lines about single women and cats running the country. Uh, it just, he, he, he's really flat, in my opinion. Your thoughts, Basil? Uh, there's a through line here, because he said that in this clip that the press should be more self-aware. When he talks about Donald Trump not being afraid to go into certain rooms, he went into uh, NABJ, the uh, uh, black journalist, and waved his finger at the black journalists that were on stage with him. So this isn't about going into rooms and not caring. This is about, uh, this is about berating people and insulting folks. That's what they do. That's what they're good. At. So, yeah, they'll go into any room uh, that they need to that's necessary, but they're going to do it with a more uh, hateful message, not one where they're willing to actually engage and talk about issues. Guys, stay with us because we're also following the results of some key battleground primaries. Battleground Michigan, a, a crucial race set in the fight for Senate there. Current Democratic Congresswoman Alyssa Slotkin, we've learned, will face Trump ally and former Republican Congressman Mike Rogers on the House side, another race we're following, squad member uh, Cori Bush now on the outs. She was defeated in another expensive primary battle for progressives. She faced nearly $9 million from pro-Israel groups opposing her. And NBC Steve Kornacki's at the big board to break it down for us. What did we learn last night, Steve? Yeah, well, as you say, on the House side here, we, we had this about a month ago in New York, the story of a member of the so-called squad losing in a Democratic primary. Let me show you how it happened in the Cori Bush race incumbent, Cori Bush losing to challenger Wesley Bell in the Democratic primary. This is the first congressional district of Missouri. I'm going to zoom in here because it's geographically small, but uh, population dense here. And basically, you, the story here is there's St. Louis City. It's the city of St. Louis is entirely within this district, but the population in St. Louis has been really going down. It's under 300,000 now. So the district isn't just St. Louis. It's also St. Louis County. You get into more suburban areas. There are some smaller cities. There's a bit of a, a significant contrast between the city of St. Louis and St. Louis County, and you see it in the results. In the city of St. Louis last night, Corey Bush won by high single digits over Wesley Bell. Then out in the St. Louis County portion of the district, a very different story. Wesley Bell double digits there over Bush. When Bush first won this seat four years ago, she also unseated an incumbent member of Congress. That was William Lacey Clay. And back then, she also lost uh, St. Louis County, but it was only by four points while winning St. Louis City by about the margin she did last night. So the difference for Bush between when she won the seat and losing it in this primary last night was in St. Louis County, the floor kind of falling out for her there. And again, Again, it adds up a, a close race here, but uh, a six-point difference here. The other thing, too, is, again, when I'm talking about the population declining in St. Louis City, when Bush won this seat in 2020 in that primary, 60 percent of the vote in that primary came out of the city of St. Louis last night. Again, it's down to 53 percent, so more kind of weight population vote.
voting power wise now in the county portion of the district. So that is Corey Bush losing again another squad member there. And just take a look quickly. You mentioned in Michigan, no surprise in these primaries last night for the Senate on the Democratic side. Alyssa Slotkin, this was expected winning the Democratic nomination uh, on the Republican side. Mike Rogers again expected winning the Republican nomination. But what this race, the significance of this race in November, obviously it's about Senate control, but more specifically, it's this. The Democrats are, are need to win two of the three of Montana, Ohio, West Virginia, two of the three red states that they now have seats in that they're trying to hang on to. To have any realistic chance of controlling the Senate, they got to win at least they got to win two of those three uh, likely. Um, you get to a state like Michigan. This is one Republicans would like potentially to pad a potential majority in the Senate. This is the kind of seat for Democrats that sort of must win in addition to finding a way to win in those red states. So it's it's a huge race in terms of the Senate here. Uh, but for Democrats, it's much more if they have any chance of controlling the Senate. This one's must win for them. Republicans have passed to the Senate control that don't require them to win Michigan. All right, Steve Kornacki, thank you. And Susan and Basil are still with us. Basil, looking at that Missouri primary and Corey Bush's loss in the primary, how much of that do you think was about Gaza and her stance? And how much of it was about her own, perhaps, specific vulnerabilities? She was under a federal investigation for use of campaign funds. Well, I think a lot of it, it does relate to uh, her stance on the war in Gaza because you had pro-Israel groups donating significant amounts of money to her, as they did in the race against Jamal Bowman in New York City. So I think that that is an important common thread. I would also say that those districts, while centered in some ways in the urban areas in the, in the New York district in the Bronx, it's all, they're also largely suburban districts, more moderate voters. And in this particular case with Corey Bush, uh, the sense that she wasn't as aligned as some of those voters would have liked her to be on the Biden agenda, I think also impacted that city. And Susan, we've seen two squad losses now. Does that suggest that their impact or their power in the Democratic Party might be waning? Not necessarily. I think they're in, because they um, are very vocal and put out their messaging, you know, loud and they don't care about the frankly the other members of their caucus um, they they do get a lot of attention they tend to be on the outer left whereas the same thing happens by the way on the right when you have the more wacky conservatives go out there and they get the press attention what at the end of the day it shows though is that we're starting to see people really wanting moderation hmm. That's what it comes down to. Let's look at that Michigan yes. Senate race now. Again, we've got uh, Alyssa Slotkin, Mike Rogers, both with foreign policy credentials. And this is a race that's been somewhat reshaped by what's happening in Gaza, right? Because of the Arab and the Muslim population in Michigan specifically. Susan, do you see this as a real chance for a GOP pickup? Absolutely. But I see it more importantly as probably one of the best races in the country, because I think it's going to be kind of an old school campaign. They're talking about issues. They're talking about national security. The thing that can really gum up the works are these big outside packs who come in with these messaging, these messages that could throw off either side. But overall, I, I think basically it. Whoever wins, it's it's a good thing for the country. Remember the uncommitted vote, Basil, <laughs> in Michigan when right. President Biden was still on the ticket and there was such a, a turnout with uncommitted in his primary there. Yet now we have a new Democratic ticket and there's been some suggestion by these groups, uncommitted group, another group, the Black Muslim Leadership Council Fund was part of that uncommitted push, has endorsed Kamala Harris. Do you see that becoming a more of a safe space now for Democrats, that state? I, I do, actually. And, um, I, and to, you know, to that very point, I, I think, and as we talked about before, the harris waltz ticket resets the entire narrative for this race. So Kamala Harris has an opportunity to sort of carve out her own path forward, maybe not right right now, maybe a little bit after the convention. But I do think there are a lot of voters that are taking another look. And the fact that they, she's got some strong labor support and they were immediately on board with her, I think, again, gives this a good, uh, Democrats a good opportunity here. Basil Smeichel, Susan Del Percio, thank you both.